Amen. Thank you, sir. All right, let's go to the book of James, chapter 1, if you will, please. The book of James, chapter 1. I want us to read, beginning in verse 1, and go down through verse 12, and uh, we'll continue looking into uh, the book of James. And we're going to talk about dealing with temptation, dealing with trials, uh, Satan's attack, and uh, in the book of James he deals uh, with these things. And he wants the, God wants us to be completely dedicated to him. And he wants to use us in a marvelous way. And uh, so I want to ask myself tonight, how is the Lord using me through the week? How is he using me through the week? Am I making inroads with folk? Am I sharing the gospel with folk? Am I praying for folk? Every day, my life and yours should be a light. Amen? Let your light so shine before men that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. I love the book of James. So let's begin reading here uh, in verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall. And remember we talked about this is, means when you come up on uh, these divers temptations, many and varied temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. God knows how to work in our life if we'll let him. You agree with me? You agree with me? God wants to work in our life if we will let him. And he will. If we'll open up our heart, open up our mind, uh, and yield ourselves to him, uh, then he will work uh, in our life, even though we fall upon these many different uh, temptations. Now, God doesn't tempt anybody. But he allows temptations to come to teach us. And we'll get into that uh, as we go along. Verse 4, uh, but let patience have her perfect or to mature work that you may be perfect, once again mature, and entire wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth all men liberally and it braideth not and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let no man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low. Because as the flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive a crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man, when he is tempted, is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And here's that strong couple of verses here. Then let lust have, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err. Don't move away, he says. Don't move away. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Now, there's a lot in those verses. A lot there. And we could spend a lot of time there. Uh, I want to just uh, share some opening remarks with you. I want you to think about the perfect believer and suffering. The perfect believer and suffering. Now, that doesn't mean sinless. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is here is the mature believer. He's growing. Well, when you begin to grow, Satan will not like that. Have you ever discovered that? You just sort of dilly around and dabble around in the Christian life. Satan won't bother you. 
But you really put on your boots, put on your big boy clothes. You really get going. You know what Satan's going to do? He's going to take notice of you. He probably won't take notice of you. But until you start really serving the Lord, you really get into the Word. You begin to memorize Scripture. You start doing all of that. Then you start witnessing. And God begins to use you. Here comes the devil with throwing everything that he can at you. Now he knows enough about me already. And he knows enough about you already to make an attack. But when I really get zeroed in on serving him and you do the same, then here he comes. How many of you have experienced waking up on Sunday morning, Saturday night you were looking forward to going to church? You wanted to get there. You wanted to be there for the singing. You wanted to be there for the fellowship. You wanted to be there for the preaching. But you're just wore out. Or you just don't feel good. Or you're upset about something. Well, I think I'm just going to lay in bed today. I think I'm just going to stay at home today. That's Satan. That's Satan. And uh, it, that works for him in a lot of different areas. And so we want to understand that the Lord really wants to use us and he's willing to give us and can give us the power we need to be victorious. And let me say this. Tonight... I would say this, all of us here tonight are at a different level of spirituality probably. Uh, you ladies and you men, and we have our calling. Ladies, you have a calling from God. You, you have a calling from God. Men, we have a calling from God. And once we find what that calling is and we begin to live in that calling and we begin to make progress, then here comes the devil. Here he comes. And will do anything that he can. And so in verse 1, look at it again. James, a servant of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes scattered abroad, greeting. Now these were saved men and women, but because of persecution, they were scattered abroad. They were scattered abroad. They were having a tough time. Now, before their salvation, Satan left them alone. But then their conversion, and as they began to grow, Satan began to watch, keep an eye out, and began to formalize a plan. I keep bringing this up because it's so important. Do you understand that next to God... Satan is the most powerful and most intelligent being in the universe. Think about that now. Next to God, Satan is the most powerful, the most intelligent, resourceful being in the universe. And so we are no match for him. We are no match for him. And so we have to be filled with the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, we need to know the Word of God. In the last few years, I've started doing something with my prayer life. Uh, I may have said something about this earlier on. But earlier on in my, my years as, as a pastor, I, my prayer life was, was shallow and I was asking for things and so forth and so on. But I've learned in the, these later years that the way God seems to really bless me in my prayer life is when I pray Scripture when I pray scripture. Therefore, I want to memorize as many scriptures as I can. I want to know what scripture to go to that relates to my temptation. See what I'm saying? You just don't say, Lord, bless me and my wife, Jim and his wife, us four no more. You just don't do that. See, you have an organized, an organized group coming after you, led by Satan. He does not want this church to grow, and he does not want you to grow. And he'll throw everything he can at us. Now, let me just say this while I'm, while I'm in, into this. We need to set a meeting with our leadership here in a little bit, all of our leadership, and we need to sit down and ask God to give us a plan. His plan for the future. For children, 
whatever, adults, whatever. What needs to be changed? What do, do we need to do to get the best results for the glory of God? Well, we need it to be biblical, of course. But we need to pray about that and get things going and moving uh, for the future. You agree with me on that? But when we do that, Satan, will, he, he's already thrown everything he can at us. But that when we do that, then he will go after us. And he'll go after you. But here in verse 1, I, I love this passage. James, a servant, a bond slave of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. Now he had received information from these people about the persecution that they were having. And so he's writing back to them to encourage them and to give them advice as to what they can do to keep going. And so isn't it interesting that in verse 2 he comes up with this statement, my brethren. And that phrase there, my brethren, is a very kind, sweet uh, way of saying things. I just wish that we Christians could really be of one much more than we are. Work together better. You know, you can get a whole lot more done with a lot of people working together than you can with little picky things here and little picky things there and so forth and so on. And so he knows what's going on. And so he says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. That's good news. They're suffering. They've been, they, they've been run out of, their, out of their land. Their homes have been taken from them. Their children, their relatives have been persecuted. Many of them have died. And so he writes them back and, and he says, Count it all joy when you fall or come upon divers' temptations. What do you think they thought when they read that? What do you think that the leader of the group read that to, the, to this group, these groups that were scattered abroad? I'm sure that they sat there and they said, what? What? We've lost our home. We've lost relatives. We've lost friends. We've been persecuted. We've been hated. We don't know these people that, that we are uh, mingling with are hateful, evil, cruel. What do you mean, James? What do you mean? And of course, James goes on through the book and reveals what he's talking about. And here's what he's saying. God knows how to use testings and trials and hardships to make us grow, to help us develop, to help us to become the man or woman God wants us to be. So these people that were scattered abroad, and so he says, greeting, count it all joy when you come upon divers, and that means many and varied kinds. Think about that now. Many and varied kinds. Satan doesn't have just a few tricks in his bag. Got that? He doesn't have just a few. He has a multiplicity. He's had thousands of years of experience dealing with man. Amen? Thousands of years of experience dealing with man. And so he wants to encourage these people. And then he goes on to say in verse 3, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And then I love verse 4. But let patience have her perfect work. When you fall upon divers temptations, and Satan throws everything he has at you, you will be driven to the word. You'll be driven to your knees. You'll be driven to church and the people of God where you can sit together and study the Bible and pray together and you're there for one another. Listen, that's what this church is for. So we can be here for one another. Not against one another, but for one another. And the old devil just loves to get in a church and split things up and have people at variance with one another. Listen, you'll never overcome Satan like that. We'll never have victory over him like that. And so he says, let patience have her perfect work, 
that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And I love verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. I've memorized most of, ch of chapter 1, and many times I find myself praying these verses and asking the Lord to help me to put this in practice uh, in my life. So here's the perfect believer and suffering, or the mature believer and, per and, and persecution and so forth uh, and so on. Now, here is God's perfect work. Now think with me now. Here is God's perfect work. God has a purpose. Brother Keith, God has a purpose for you. And Jesse, God has a purpose for you. And I could go around and I could say, He has a purpose for every, every one of you. Brother Hamer back there, God has a purpose. And many times we'll not find that purpose unless persecution comes. Trials and heartaches come that turn you upside down. One of Satan's greatest weapons, what do you think it is? Depression. One of Satan's greatest weapons is depression. If he can get a man depressed. How many of you have studied uh, the life of Spurgeon over in England? How many of you have studied his life? Later on in Spurgeon's years, there at uh, the, the tabernacle, Satan would battle him. You ought to read his life. Get, get, get one of the, a book of his life and read it. In later years, God was blessing that church more than he had ever had. Satan got after him to the point where he would have to take respites to the south of England and take a couple of weeks or a month to rest up and go back and preach again from the pulpit. Satan got him so depressed. Read his story. If the devil can get a man like Spurgeon depressed, what can he do for us? And I know all of us have had battles with depression. All of us have. Different levels, I'm sure. But Satan wants to get us to that point of, of, of depression where we, give, we just give up. I... Uh, I'll not mention any names, but I know some good pastors, good preachers, and they just quit because of depression. I'm not going to name the man's name because some of you wouldn't probably know him. He pastored in Chattanooga, Tennessee, one of the best preachers. He could sing, his, he could preach, tremendous evangelist. He told the story in our pulpit at Pleasantdale. And he said to the congregation, he said, we were growing. The church was, we were building a new building. God was blessing us so much. And he said, through the week, I had no time for my wife. I had no time for my kids. I had no time for anything but stay on the building. Stay, and, and, and all of the, these things that were going on. One night at 12 o'clock, he drove in his driveway at home. Got out of the, dry, got out of the car and, and went out of the driveway, driveway into the house to go to bed and get some sleep. And he said when he started toward the bedroom, the phone rang. And when he went over to pick up the phone, of course, it was a church member that needed something. And he said... I couldn't take it anymore. He said, I lost it. He said, I took the phone and I yanked the cord out of the wall and I threw it out the window and I went outside and sat down on the porch and just wept. And he said, my wife came out and put her arms around me. God was blessing him mightily, but here comes Satan. Satan. Now, I hope anything like that doesn't happen to you. I hope something like that doesn't happen to me. But that's the things that Satan can do. That's the thing that he can do. And so let me just insert this here. If you want to go on with God, get you a strong foundation. Stay in the book. Read it every day. Memorize it. 
witness to other people and he will perfect us uh, in, our surf, in, in, our, in our work for God. A perfect work, now listen to me, a perfect work is what God desires for us. He wants to do a perfect work in our life. That's his purpose. I'm looking at you this, this evening, out, out there, and here I am standing here. God wants to work in you even more than he ever has. And he wants to work on, in me more than he ever has. He wants to have his perfect work. And he'll work in your heart to do that. Then he wants to put within you that perfect gift that will help complete you as you go along. And you'll be that man, you'll be that woman that he wants you to be. Think of the ways God can use you then. And I don't think it's uh, coincident that the Lord laid this series of messages, study on the book of James, for Sunday evening. I could have done it Saturday, Sunday morning or Wednesday evening, but there are others. I feel there's a reason because I think the Lord wants to use the Sunday night crowd in a special way. I really do. And so pray about that. And so here there's the perfect believer and suffering. He wants to have a perfect work in you. He wants to have a, give a perfect gift so that you will uh, be a giant for God. And then he wants to work a perfect law in you. And that perfect work is what? That perfect law is what? God's book, God's book, the Bible. This is his book. It is the Bible. Now, all right, I, we don't have a lot of time left. I want you to look with me at verse 2 through 12 again, if you'll go to your Bible there. I don't want I, I to just move briskly along with this. I want us to really begin to think about what he's saying here. Let's read verses 2 through verse 12. And then we'll say a few things, and then I'll let you go tonight. My brethren, when I read, uh, when I read uh, these different authors, uh, Paul and, and all of them, you, you may think I'm sort of silly, but as I read, I try to think about how would they say that? How would they sound as they were saying that? That's, that's just me. And uh, I want to get to... Get a hold of a man's heart, of the man, the thrust of a, of a man's love for the Lord, and desire to serve. So I can put that in in my heart. And more, the devil will try to keep you from that. He'll fight you. You've got to be ready. All right, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and it braideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Let me stop there a second. God can use anybody. It doesn't education, uh, physical prowess. It doesn't matter. Uh, I, have I told you about Gary French? Who I went to school with Gary at, at Tennessee Temple. Gary, I had polio when he was when he was a kid. Gary was a full grown man, that tall. Full grown man, that tall, and he had crutches. And he would walk, and we would try to help him. And he didn't want no help. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. I can get. I can do it. And he was a little smart aleck. He'd do everything he could to make you mad. Slip up behind you and hit you with his cane, you know, and that kind of thing, play tricks. But uh, he, had, he had trouble getting from class to class. You know what I mean? That bell would ring and you've got about 10 minutes to get from this class to that one. And you, uh, you might be in Herndon Hall and you might be going over to the, to, the, uh, to the student center building. And it's way over there and so forth. But... That guy would go out visiting with the student body on Saturday and Sunday afternoon. 
And he'd be on those canes, walking up and down town Chattanooga, giving out tracts and witnessing to people. He was not going to let that stop him. And he was a great blessing to me. Uh, and I really appreciated him uh, so much. Uh, verse 9, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low. Because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen for a burning of the heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grass of the fashioneth of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Now verse 12, blessed, blessed. Uh, you could say out of the Greek word here that he, he says that word is uh, spiritually prosperous. Spiritually prosperous. Blessed, spiritually prosperous is, is the man or woman that endureth temptation. Now I love this. For when he is tried, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Go into the future with me. Go into the future with me and we're at the judgment seat of Christ. And we're giving an account for what we've done. And here are the men and women that have been faithful and they receive this crown of life. And you, maybe you will receive that crown of life. Maybe I will. Wouldn't that be a tremendous thing to be so faithful to the Lord that you'd receive a crown of life that passeth not away? And uh, you did it because you loved the Lord. Amen? You did it because you loved the Lord. Uh, I was going to move on, but I think I'll stop right there because there's so many things I want to say about trials. Uh, and the first thing we're going to look at next Sunday evening if we're here or not in heaven is we're going to look at faith and trials. How does that work in our life? Faith and trials. All righty, we'll have a word of prayer and the ladies will remain in here and they'll have their prayer time. We'll go in the, men will go in the fellowship hall and we'll end our day with prayer. It's 15 till 7. Uh, we try to be done at, at, at 7, 7, 10, something like that. And then you can get home and rest uh, up uh, for, uh, for uh, the next day. Uh, I understand that uh, my car... Uh, gotten so wet and, 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 and dirty that after church Brother Robert's going to go over and clean it up for me and vacuum it and so forth and so on he's told me graciously so Robert thank you so much you're a friend if I have a friend Robert it's you I can see the smile on your face alright let's stand please <laughs> oh my goodness Let's see, this young man right here that bought our lunch today, he's such a wonderful friend. I wish now I'd ordered the highest meal on the, on the docket, but I didn't do that for you. Dismiss us in prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father.